What does the word translated patience mean? The Greek word, and by the way, we are continuing the study of things to supply or add to our faith. The Greek word, hupomone, consists of the preposition hupo and the verb meno, and uh, we'd like to talk about that. Let me just make a note, though. Uh, sometimes this is written with one E, but uh, Strong writes it with two to indicate the A sound. Uh, the reason that we can't use an A is because an A sounds like ah in the Greek. So we have to have some other way of distinguishing ah from A. And so the way that is done is with uh, a double E. So the Greek word then, hupomone, and that's why we always pronounce the double E that way, consists of, uh, it's a compound word with these other two words. Now, meno is found 120 times in the New Testament. Generally, it means abide or remain, as in uh, John chapter 1, 32 and 33. We're going to be taking a look at uh, various scriptures this morning. I think most of them are posted on here, so you can uh, uh, follow along. But let's uh, go to that first one and see how it is translated. John chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. This is uh, concerning Jesus at his baptism. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. That's uh, the word uh, meno that is being translated here. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And so twice in those two verses, the Greek word minnow is used. Uh, it also is used in the passage that was just read for us in John chapter 15, uh, verses four through eight. You may have noticed that it begins with abide. This is another one of the translations of that Greek verb. Uh, not only remain, but abide in me uh, and I in you. And uh, you can't bear fruit of itself, the branch can't, unless it abides in the vine. Uh, and uh, so you have to abide in Jesus. He goes on to say, I am the vine and you are the branches. And you notice how many times this word appears in the text. Uh, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Again, we see it in the next verse. He does not abide in me, is cast forth as a branch. Uh, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words in you, uh, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And uh, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. But all of this is contingent upon abiding in Christ and his word abiding in you. Now, uh, let's go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 through and 25, to see that Peter himself uses the verb form of this uh, prior to the passage we're studying in 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, and verse 6, when he writes in 1 Peter 1, 21, uh, who through him, or verse 23 rather, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And then also verse 24, but the word of the Lord endures, same Greek verb, forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel is preached to you. So this word is used, this verb is used a number of times in the New Testament. In fact, uh, John uses it 23 times in the short epistle of 1 John. Well, that's the 
main verb that we're talking about this morning that is uh, going to be translated as a noun as patience. Now, when hupo, the preposition, is added to meno, two related words uh, are formed. Well, let's begin with the verb first. Hupo meno, the verb, is translated endure. And we want to look at a few passages uh, where that occurs. Let's begin with Matthew chapter 24 and verse 13. In that passage, we read uh, Jesus giving instructions to his disciples about what would be occurring before the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Well, that's not only true of uh, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, but it's also true uh, enduring to the end of the world also. But anyway, the idea is that you must endure. Then going to Romans chapter 12 and uh, verse 12, we find Paul using hupomeno in order to say, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. And uh, then we find it uh, also in 1 Peter chapter 2, where uh, Peter uses the word uh, prior to 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20 for what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults that you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer for it, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. So uh, we find it in all of uh, those usages. And in fact, the verb is used 17 times altogether in the New Testament. But now let's come to the noun, which is uh, what we're dealing with in 2 Peter 1, 6, and that is hupomone, which is usually translated patience. That's the general translation of the word. That doesn't mean it can't be translated another way, but that's how we generally find it. Now, as you think about this, you might be thinking, patience. I just hate it when people talk about patience because it hits home. Uh, but it, this isn't that kind of patience. So you can breathe a sigh of relief. Actually, that kind of patience is what we talked about last week with self-control. Uh, so uh, if you need to chastise yourself for not being patient, go back and, and listen to the one from last week. Uh, no, this is not that kind of patience, the way we usually use it. What it is is the kind of patience that endures through prolonged effort, uh, something that is not uh, easy to have to deal with. And so this is more over a long period of time we develop the kind of patience that we need. And uh, according to Thayer, in the New Testament, this is the, uh, refers to the characteristics of a man who is unswerved. Now, you know what it means to swerve, especially if you're driving on uh, rain and you happen to hit something, your car will swerve. Or, or maybe you command the car to swerve yourself in order to uh, avoid hitting something in the road. Well, in this case, the characteristic is of a man who is unswerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest of trials and sufferings. These do not deter him. These do not cause him to swerve. He is able to endure these things. So we want to consider various ways in which we are to be patient from some of the 32 verses in which the word appears in the New Testament. 
First of all, bringing forth fruit is found in the parable of the seed in which Jesus uh, presents in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. So let's read that passage first because uh, this is important. It's not how it generally is applied, but it's an important application. Uh, Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 4. And when a great multitude had gathered and others came to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. And uh, what he said was that a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and it was trampled down. We're probably all familiar with this. And the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on a rock. As soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when he said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, not very many people got this. They listened carefully. But they didn't understand the meaning. Even his disciples did not understand the meaning. And uh, so they asked him what it meant. And he begins to explain in verse 11 down through verse 15. The parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil take, uh, comes and takes away the word out of their hearts lest they should uh, believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, but believe for a while, and in time of temptation, fall away. And the ones that fell among the thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. And now watch this one. The ones that fell on the good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart keep it and bear fruit with patience. With patience. Now, when we talk about bearing fruit, uh, is he talking about developing the fruit of the Spirit? As in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, no, he's not. Uh, it would be easy to maybe look at that and associate it with that, but he's not talking about bearing the fruit of the Spirit in Luke chapter 8. We do need to develop that fruit of the Spirit, but this passage is dealing with reproduction. How we get more Christians sowing the word of God, and so forth. And so the seed sown produces something. It produces faithful Christians who do what? Sow more seed, which brings forth more Christians. That's what's meant by bearing fruit in this passage. And uh, some have many, uh, some uh, 30, some 60, some 100 fold. So that is uh, what Christians are uh, looking for and hoping to accomplish is to bring more into the fold. So Christians bear fruit in patience. What does that mean? Why do we have to uh, practice evangelism in patience? Because we know that everyone is not going to want to obey the gospel. When I was younger, I couldn't understand that. I thought, well, why wouldn't anybody want to obey the gospel? It's all good, but nevertheless, many people are not interested in good. Many people do not want salvation. Many people want to live selfishly and worldly rather than godly. Um, so... They know that everyone's not going to want to obey, and, and they may have experienced times of disappointment and discouragement 
in trying to lead others to Christ, but they endure bearing uh, their uh, fruit in patience. And so that's a very important element to add in uh, this situation. The Chinese bamboo tree teaches a lesson in sowing with patience. You plant the seed, you water it and fertilize it, but the first year, nothing happens. The second year, you water it and fertilize it, but again, nothing happens. So you water it and fertilize it the third year with the same result, nothing. The fourth year, you water it and fertilize it, and you look in, in vain to find anything growing. But when you do it the fifth year, you finally see it in the course of about six weeks, it grows roughly 90 feet. Four years, nothing. Fifth year, it grows 90 feet high. A few people upon whom you have sown the seed may be like the Chinese bamboo. They, it's uh, been planted and you are watering it and nurturing it, but nothing happens, and nothing happens, and nothing happens. But eventually, it may take root, and that's why we need to sow the word in patience. Uh, Roland mentioned his uh, uncle that he had worked on uh, for years, and finally, when he was the age of 84, he obeyed the gospel. He told me privately that if uh, uh, that was all he'd ever accomplished in his life, it would have been worth it to save that one soul that was dear to him. So we sow in patience. But now we want to look at some of the other things that are associated with it. And uh, we go to Luke chapter 21, verses 16 through 19. Luke chapter 21, verses 16 through 19, which is similar to what we read already in Matthew. In this passage, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will send some of you to your death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake but not a hair of your head shall be lost. Oh, wait a minute. He just said, you, may, you will be hated, you will be betrayed. How can not a hair of your head be lost? We're talking more than of the physical here. We're also being talked of the spiritual. In your patience, possess your soul. This is why we said earlier, this is not the patience we ordinarily think about that uh, requires us to get through certain uh, brief circumstances. This is an ongoing thing. In patience, possess your souls, regardless of persecution or betrayal or even death. Such usage is also found in Revelation, as you might expect, uh, chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. Revelation 13, beginning with uh, verse 9. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of and the faith of the saints. The saints shall be preserved spiritually even though they are being put to death physically and God shall avenge them. Revelation chapter 14 beginning with verse 9. Then a third angel followed them with a loud voice saying if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand 
he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they shall have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that their rest may, uh, they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. They patiently endure all of this persecution and death. And we see that Christians in the first century frequently had to be able to endure these types of persecution. Now, this same subject is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning with verse 3, a passage probably familiar because it's often quoted. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. So that we ourselves boast of you among churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you rest who are troubled with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished from everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. But the critical fact there is that you must endure those critical times that are being dis discussed. Those uh, who are suffering uh, persecution and tribulation. Let's go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 3. And not only that, but we uh, also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, or as the footnote says, endurance, the very thing, uh, patience, that we are discussing this morning. Tribulation brings about patience. James writes the same thing in chapter 1. Uh, verses 3 and 4. James chapter 1, beginning with verse 3. Knowing that the... Well, let's back up to verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I know there are times when we are undergoing various trials that uh, we may not be exactly thankful at that moment. But there, it produces something that is good for us. Being challenged helps make us stronger, helps make us 
endure with patience. All adversity has the same effect. It does not need to be persecution. Now, many of the passages uh, that we have looked at have involved persecution on the part of the ungodly toward the godly, but it doesn't have to be precisely that. It can be any trials that we are enduring. Notice, uh, enduring. Notice uh, James chapter 5, verse 11. But indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the endurance or perseverance of Job and have seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Well, uh, was Job suffering because of his righteousness? Well, maybe indirectly because he caught Satan's attention and he maligned him, he accused him of things that were not so. But no, he was suffering from the various uh, ailment that he uh, had been inflicted with. The loss of material things was uh, acceptable and uh, uh, unfortunate, uh, you know, that that happened. But Job was dealing with that, and so Satan decided to make it even worse by afflicting him from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. But Job endured that with patience. All adversity has uh, that kind of effect. We can let it break us or we can learn to endure just like we might with persecution. Number four, speaking of God giving to all what they deserve as we did in Revelation 14 and, and uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, Let's go to Romans chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Romans 2, beginning with verse 6. Speaking of uh, the righteous judgment of God in verse 5, verse 6 continues, Who will render each one according to his deeds. Notice that who will render each one according to his deeds. Does that sound like predestination? Does that sound like once saved, always saved? Who shall reward each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation and wrath yes it depends on how you accept or reject God this is your decision and you will be judged according to it in this passage uh, we're reminded here also of Revelation chapter 2 and uh, verse 3 at uh, John records Jesus writing to the church at Ephesus. And he says in Revelation 2, 3, And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. That's what God wants of his children. And uh, so this certainly doesn't sound like Calvinism. We must choose to bear patiently the good things that God wants accomplished. And uh, we shall uh, bear fruit unless we faint Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 that we just studied recently also love demands it love bears all things endures endures all things 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 7 same verb but now closely related to finishing uh, is finishing what we have started 
Jesus said to count the cost in Luke 14, 25 through 35. But some may think about quitting. We have need of patience. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 36. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 36. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Now, the writer of Hebrews takes a small detour here to talk about people of faith, but then he comes back to this subject in chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, where he concludes, therefore we also, and by the way, this is as athletes are competing in the arena, the crowd is cheering us on to complete what we have begun, and here's the conclusion of that passage. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us. How are we going to accomplish that? Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted unto bloodshed, striving against sin. So we must run the race with endurance. We must be able to complete what we have started. The crowd is on our side, those who are looking on from heaven, the angels, the Godhead. They are all pulling for us to complete, but we must run the race with endurance. And that includes enduring temptations, going back to uh, James chapter 1 and verse 12. James write, bless, writes, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. He endures temptation. He doesn't give in to it. He endures temptation temptation and is able to overcome it. Now the Old Testament equivalent of all of this is to wait on the Lord. We find this numerous times in the Psalms. We're just going to look at Psalm 25 and verse 3, but you will find it over and over again when you read through the Psalms. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those who be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. This is talking about enduring while the Lord responds. There is often time, the Lord doesn't use our timetable. You know, we pray for something and we want it now. We think it needs to be now. Uh, how do you think the children of Israel felt waiting on the Lord to deliver them out of Egypt? I'm sure it was not by their timetable that it was done, but those who patiently endured were delivered. And so that's what we find many times. Uh, David, of course, is writing from experience when he says, uh, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Uh, so waiting on the Lord was often used in the Old Testament. There are a couple passages here in Isaiah, uh, one in chapter 30 and verse 18, where the prophet records these words, Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that, you may have, have mer that he may have mercy on you, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. 
And uh, then a more familiar passage from uh, chapter 40 and verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Uh, Fanny Crosby wrote many, many songs, but uh, this one is not uh, one of the ones that is sung very often. There is a verse, though, that is very appropriate to what we're discussing. She wrote these words, Wait on the Lord, for whom hast thou on earth or in heaven but he? Over thy soul a watch he keeps, whatever thy path may be. Christians wait upon the Lord in daily living as well as ultimately patiently waiting for the Lord to return as we already discussed in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So here are the seven ways in which we should have and demonstrate patience. Bringing forth fruit, that is in being evangelistic and bringing the gospel to other folks. We should be patient in doing that. Possessing our souls, even in persecution and death. In bearing adversity, not everything is persecution and death. Sometimes it's just bearing adverse things that happen in your life. Number four, in continually doing good. Don't quit, endure, as you will reap if you do not faint. Number five, endurance in finishing what we have begun. Enduring temptations, being able to overcome them. And waiting on the Lord in daily living as well as on Jesus' ultimate return. These are all ways in which we ought to exercise patience. Steadfastness or patience as it is usually translated, or endurance. This morning we have not dealt with how to become a Christian. If you know and you're ready to obey, let us know because we're ready to help you. If you know about repentance and confessing that he is the Son of God and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, we're ready to assist you in that. If you're already a child of God but have not been enduring as you should why not resolve to make that right between yourself and God this morning if we can help you in any of these matters let us know while we stand and while we sing